The GB News Tavern is open. It's beer time. And talking pints, I am joined by Chris Moon. I suppose um, I have to start with... Um, you're doing all right, aren't you? Yes. Life's, life's working out well for you. It, it is. What taught me through this contraption? OK. And so how it came to pass? There is... <laughs> after I left Can the Can we army, cheers each other? Sorry. Good health. Yours. Great to meet you, Lawrence. Sasha. And, uh... So, after I left the army, I wanted to do something that made a difference. I went to work for a charity clearing landmines. Obviously, with considerable success, because I found the very thing <laughs> we were looking for. Uh, ironically, doing the least dangerous thing I ever did, walking back up a safe lane, there was a landmine the blokes couldn't locate for complex technical reasons, stepped on it, right leg off, and lower right arm, uh, later amputated. And uh, I was incredibly lucky to survive. And uh, when I got out of hospital, I started to research prosthesis. And before I joined the army, I came from a farming background, and I found out that the most effective hand replacement is actually this. So I've been very involved with research and into prosthetics over the last 20 years and um, the electrical hands look really, really good. And it's really important to say that I understand entirely why many people want them. Yeah. Because when they first came out, people said, why, when the people were asked if we'd been given them, why do you want to keep it? They'd said, because the first time I feel part of the human race. So, you know, it's individual choice. And I don't want something that looks like a hand. I want something that's, that's maximum, cool. maximum function. It's uh, much cooler Well, maximum well. function. And it's um, operated by a strap around my shoulder. The elastic bands close it. Would you like to demonstrate? Pop a testicle in. <laughs> Stop it! <laughs> I have to concentrate! OK. What, what, would, what would be... Would it, would it be game over for future children? <laughs> no. No? No. Okay. Especially as for reasons of health and safety, I had to halt the demonstration. So, um, it, it, I've got a small holding. I, I love gardening. I've got loads to do. I've got a very busy... Uh, working life, so I want something that's as functional as possible. And I used to break the electrical hands, so and they're really expensive. This was, um, I think, four hundred dollars about twenty years ago, and and for me it works really well. But once again, I entirely understand why some people want something that looks like a limb. Okay, so you 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 come across as someone who's put a, put a remarkably optimistic and brave face on what is a completely life changing. Pretty yeah. to find yourself in, and yeah. you know, just the thought of you being there doing this for other human beings, so that young kids may not run across a path and get blown up by a mine. You've suffered that. What? How do you cope with the loss of a limb? Okay, I think this. I think firstly to say, different people do it in different ways, and there's no right or wrong answers, and and some people may not feel they're able to cope, and I entirely understand that. So I can only talk about my experience. Um, I think the first thing is to, to be totally realistic. And I think a lot of recovery is about hearing what you don't want to hear as much as it is about telling people what you don't want to tell them. So that, that would be my starting point. What is it about this that I don't want to hear? Well, the reality is it's not going to grow back, is it? Mm -hmm. So it's never going to be over. So you have to think about it in a way that's constructive. And a lot of my friends and family said, look, Chris Moon's life is over because his hobbies running, motorcycling, gardening and mountaineering. And above all, he lives for his work, clearing landmines. But his life's over because everything requires two arms and two legs. Nothing could be further than the truth. Now, I'm not naturally op uh, optimistic or, or positive person, but I do the work because we have a choice. And I guess what I learned uh, before... Um, I was blown up. I, I got taken prisoner by Khmer Rouge guerrillas in Cambodia. We were given a guarantee of security uh, by the United Nations. You negotiated your own release? Yes, but we were incredibly fortunate that, that we met a commander who was... Mo we were taken to a commander who was modern. It was possible to um, persuade him not to put us into the prisoner handling system, which would have been the end. Uh, but So we were incredibly fortunate. And I realised at the end of that, I thought, what have I learned from this? And I thought, we choose the way we think. And subsequently, I've studied human behaviour. I've done lots of work with psychologists and psychiatrists. And we do choose the way we think. And although it doesn't always feel like it, the way we feel is determined by the way we think. So the starting point for me is, look, I've got to accept this reality, and I get why all my family and friends think my life's over, but it isn't, because I'm going to be thankful for what I have. And every morning, I've, I, I've got a stark choice. Am I going to look on what I don't have and, and what's difficult in my life, or am I going to be thankful for what I have and what I can do? And I, I think gratitude heals, and I force myself to be thankful. And, and uh, it's not always easy. Uh, if, if it's difficult, get a book and write it down at the end of every day, because we have so much that we take for granted.
So much. And, and what, what you're saying is, you know, catastrophic thinking it can, will come to all of us anyway, you know, yep. because the mind is injured and wounded as well, yeah. uh, as well as you've had a catastrophic injury. Yeah. So what you're talking about here is, I don't know, it sounds a little bit like cognitive behavioural therapy, things like yeah, this. Yeah, I think it is. Uh, along this area, I, I hear lots of positive stuff about that. But to see you filled with such optimism, but to admit your vulnerability and the fact that it's not, it's work, as yeah, you say. it's is, it, work. Is, is, is so inspiring. Uh, do you, in terms of like young people today and yeah. the military today and, and, you know, and public service today, are you seeing that level of work? Uh, I, I think what we need to do is recognise that we have a choice because when you are really hurt, it doesn't feel like you have any choice. And, you know, we know that the um, flight, fight, flight response kicks in when we have a traumatic situation. So we'll have all these chemicals going around our bodies that may stop us thinking naturally. So I think we've got to recognise that between a stimulus and a response, there is a slight pause. And it's about developing techniques to own the pause to stop our natural emotional reactions coming in, the fight, flight, flight response. Do you believe in God? Uh, yeah, I do believe there's power of good, creativity, um, something that is beyond us. Uh, I guess nearly dying many times has made me more spiritual but far less religious. Yeah. Not that I in any way don't respect other people's views and religions. I do, uh, of course, and I have a passionate belief in the dignity of the individual. But for me, yeah, I, I, I think quantum physics tells us energy can't be destroyed. It simply changes its form. And, yeah. Chris? Oh, are we going to drink to that? Well, I'm <laughs> going to drink to that and I'm just going to thank you because you have made my day. Thank you for your courage, your bravery and your optimism. You're an example. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lawrence.